Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. As one chapter closes with the death of David, another chapter opens with the reign of his son, King Solomon. Uh, Chronicles, I'll remind you once again in the Hebrew, Dibriai Hayamim, and it means words uh, of the days or events of the times. I, I like to think of it as the words that tell of the events of the times. Uh, many of you that have hometown newspapers, it might be named the Chronicler, and that's where the name comes from, is it's uh, the words of the days, the words telling of the events of the days. In the Greek, paralipomena, I particularly like the translation of the Greek word paralipomena, things omitted. Uh, Bullinger makes the point, the man who did the scholarly notes in the Companion Bible, that Samuel and Kings are more of man's eye view of the events. On the other hand, Chronicles, we see God's eye view of the things that happened. For example, we have a king of, of Israel who was probably one of the worst five kings of Judah, I should say. His name was Ahaz. He closed down the house of God and said, nope, we're not going to worship Yahweh anymore. We're going to worship these other idols and gods, small g. Well, fortunately, he had a righteous son who assumed the throne. Hezekiah was his name. Uh, the nation had already split, and they had quit observing the Passover. Uh, Hezekiah sent messengers even to the ten northern tribes and invited them to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. In the book of Kings, we have a scant three verses covering that tremendous Passover. In the Chronicles, we have three chapters covering that. Now, in the Latin uh, language, the book is called Chronicon, uh, from whence comes our English title, Chronicles. Now, in the Hebrew canon, uh, this, the, two, the book of Chronicles is located at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, the author, which I agree with most scholars who say that Ezra most likely penned the Chronicles, uh, but the, the, whoever the chronicler was had knowledge of the events of the times of Ezra's life. So uh, another point, though, that, that, I, that I think points to Ezra. Uh, the uh, topics covered uh, beginning in 1 Chronicles chapter 10 through 2 Chronicles 36, 21, which is almost the very end of 2 Chronicles, we have the events or history up to the time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, then in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23, we have history after the captivity to the Babylonians. I like to think of the purpose of 2 Chronicles is to prove 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, which is where David, uh, some of his last advice to his son Solomon was to seek the Lord and you will find him. Uh, if, if you uh, forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And history proves that out. Uh, the kings of Judah who were close to God and worshipped Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, uh, the, the nation did good. Judah did well under a king such as that. Why? Because they received God's blessings. On the other hand, those who closed the temple of Solomon, 
Uh, do you think they receive God's blessings? Of course not. They receive ruin, destruction, and curses. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we take on the second book of Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, And Solomon, the son of David, and I'll add his mother was Bathsheba, was strengthened in his kingdom. And the Lord his God, Yahweh Elohim in the Hebrew, was with him and magnified him exceedingly. In Solomon's early years, he did well. He, he followed David's advice <clears throat> and made sure that he stayed close with the Lord. Now, Solomon is the third man king of Israel. We had Saul, first of all, who served 40 years. David also reigned 40 years. And guess what? Solomon will also reign 40 years. Coincidence? I think not. You see, God wanted to be the king of Israel. And the, the, this was kind of a test. Uh, probation is what the number 40 is in biblical numerics. God's th saying, let's see how this is going to go. Again, I don't think it was coincidence that the first three kings served 40 years. Probation. Verse 2. Then Solomon spake unto all Israel, to the captains of thousands and hundreds, that being the military, and to the judges. We learned in the first chronicles that we're talking about Levites. And to every governor in all Israel, the heads of the tribe, the tribe princes, the chief of the fathers, the heads of the major household. And he's gathering the uh, influential people, uh, those who have power, and, and he's saying to them, this is important. I, I want you all to, uh, to hear what I have to say and what the Lord has to say. Verse 3, So Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. And what he's doing here is seeking a divine blessing on his reign as king of Israel. Now, what we're talking about, the tab tabernacle of the congregation, this is the original mosaic tabernacle, the tent that Moses was instructed to construct, and, and then also the Ark of the Covenant was with the mosaic tabernacle, but had become over the, uh, the years separated, because at this time the Ark of the Covenant is in Jerusalem, where David had a high priest by the name of Abiathar, uh, although the Mosaic Tabernacle remained during that period of time in Gibeon, which is in the tribe of Benjamin, and was also an authorized or legal place of offering. There was an altar of burnt offering at the Mosaic Tabernacle. <clears throat> Zadok was the high priest at Gibeon, Abiathar the high priest at Jerusalem. Verse 4. But, or indeed, the ark of God had David brought up from kerjath Jerim to the place which David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it uh, at Jerusalem. The ark was in Jerusalem, but the altar of burnt offering at Gibeon was still a legal place of worship, although there was an altar of burnt offering in Jerusalem as well. Now, uh, of course, it took two attempts for David to bring the Ark of the Covenant up from kerjath Jerim uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, they messed up the first time. They placed the Ark of God on an ox-drawn cart. Uh, that's how the Philistines, the heathen Philistines, returned the Ark of God to Jerusalem after they stole it from Israel. Um, and, and the first time they were going across a low place, and Uzzah, uh, who's thought to have been a Levite, 
uh, reached forth his hand to steady the ark, which was about to fall off the cart, and Levites were not to touch any holy thing on the, the threat of death. God struck Uzzah dead. Peretz Uzzah is the name of that place until this day. David and the priest pulled out the uh, Torah and did a little reading and realized that they were supposed to carry the Ark of God on poles or staves, as they're called in the King James Version Bible, uh, by the Kohathites, one of the major families of the Levites. <clears throat> Verse 5, Moreover, the brazen altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord, and Solomon, the congregation, sought unto it. Now these uh, artisans were responsible, they were artistic craftsmen, you could think of, fabricators of metals, if you will. A lot of scholars scratch their heads on this brazen altar. Uh, it's simply the altar of burnt offering that was designed for the Mosaic Tabernacle. But at the time, Korah and his uh, Reubenite friends rebelled against Moses and Aaron and, and threatened their leadership, tried to take over the leadership, uh, Aaron over the priesthood, the religious aspects of Israel, and Moses, the government, the leader of the nation. And Moses said, you, you guys be down here with your censors tomorrow morning and we'll see who God has chosen to minister unto him at the tabernacle. Well, they had 250 with little brass censers to offer incense. Well, they offered incense to the Lord and God struck them all dead with a consuming fire. About the only thing left was the melted brass from <clears throat> their little censers. And God instructed Moses to uh, have Eleazar, the, the son of Aaron, take the melted brass, beat it into plates, and attach it to the altar of burnt offering as a reminder to all of Israel what happened uh, with Korah. You remember the earth swallowed up uh, Korah and his troop, opened up her mouth, the earth itself, and swallowed Korah and those who uh, refused to obey Moses when he told them to move away from him. Verse 6, And Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation, and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, Seek him and you will find him. And of course, we don't seek Him today with burnt offerings. We seek the Lord by reading and studying the letter that He wrote to us. It's called the Bible. We also seek Him in prayer. I encourage you to talk with your Heavenly Father. Do it on a regular basis. Uh, he's the closest relative that you have. And of course, you can also seek Him by offering Him your adoration and your love. 1,000 burnt offerings, 1,000 in biblical numerics, divine completeness and glory of God. Verse 7, In that night did God appear unto Solomon, and this is actually the night after the sacrifices were made, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And we learn in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, how God manifested himself to uh, Solomon. It was in a dream. Now I want you to think about that. What would, if, if God uh, appeared before you, manifested himself, and said, ask what I shall give thee, what would you ask for? Well, you know, and if you ask for anything, that you need to do His work, He will give it to you. Jesus made that clear in the New Testament. Ask what you need in my name and God will give it to you. This ministry is a prime example of that. If you're willing to do the work, 
uh, God will provide the bricks. And uh, he's been bringing them in by the truckload here at Shepherd's Chapel. What will Solomon ask for? And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy, this is loving kindness or grace, unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. God chose Solomon to reign in David's stead, as we learned in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 5. Verse 9, Solomon continues, Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established. He's referring to the seed where God would build David's house and there would be someone to sit on the throne forever. That being fulfilled when Messiah returns at the second advent, Jesus Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust. In Hebrew, this is much as the dust of the earth in multitude. The promise that God made to Abraham, I'm going to make your seed as numerous as the stars of heaven and as numerous as the sands of the sea. At the close of uh, David and Solomon's reign, the nation of Israel would uh, rival any nation on earth. They had grown uh, by population, census of the people, uh, the armies, they had also grown geographically in areas of, that they controlled, if not totally, at least economically. Verse 10, Solomon continues, Give me now wisdom and knowledge. This word knowledge in the Hebrew is rarely used in the Old Testament. It's mada, and Bullinger says it means inner consciousness that I may go out and come in before the people. This is a, a figure of speech, meaning that in my day-to-day -day, uh, going out and coming in, day-to-day -day activities. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And Solomon was given wisdom. Uh, Solomon would be responsible for writing two of the books of the Bible, as most of you know, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a group of contrasts between if you do things right or if you do things wrong. And he makes it clear, in Pro Solomon makes it clear through the inspiration of God in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 that the reverence, uh, the fear, it's translated in the English in the King James Version, it should be reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. And then the contrasting negative to that, but fools despise uh, instruction. Solomon knew where his wisdom came from. There was none wiser than Solomon in the flesh other than Jesus Christ. You know, his wisdom, and you can ask God for wisdom. You don't have to wait for him to appear to you in a dream or manifest himself. James chapter 1 verse 5 makes it very clear that if any of you lack wisdom, ask God and he will give it abundantly. And that's the way it is. You, you ask for wisdom uh, and of course there's a difference between wisdom as far as street smarts are concerned. Uh, what comes to mind is a drug dealer you know, he's got probably a little extra jingle in his pocket than most people do, money. Uh, he drives a nice car, always has nice clothes, but is he really getting ahead? Not in the long run, maybe in the short term, but not in the long run. So uh, ask God for wisdom. Uh, God certainly gave Solomon wisdom as it's written in 1 Kings chapter 3, soon after this event that where God appeared to him in a dream, uh, two women came to Solomon. Uh, they had each had an infant, and one of the infants had died in the night. And the one who lost her son took the other ones and said, no, this is my son. And the controversy, uh, the disagreement was whose son was the child that remained alive. 
and they presented their case to Solomon, and Solomon said, bring me a sword. I'll fix this. I'll cut the baby in half and give half to, to each woman. That'll solve the matter. And the woman who actually was the mother of the child said, no, stop, stop, don't do that. I, I, it's her child, give it to her. Solomon knew only the real mother would rather give up her child than to have it die by the sword. God gave Solomon wisdom. Verse 11, And God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart to ask for wisdom, in other words, in your mind, that thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast asked long life. You didn't ask for any of those things for yourself but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. A good thing to remember in your prayers when you ask for things. Uh, be compassionate toward others. People who are in need, pray for them. Don't, don't always pray to God, I need a new car, or I need a vacation, or I need this, or I need that. Uh, a parent gets mighty tired of hearing a child who is constantly wanting something and never giving anything back. So be compassionate in your prayers. Uh, ask for things for other people. Uh, God will add those things on to you. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches, this is the Lord speaking to Solomon, and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had uh, that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. And that's saying a lot. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, successful kings before David was very successful. There were a lot of successful kings after. But uh, saying that Solomon would be, uh, all these things would be added on to him, uh, that's saying something. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 14, long life is omitted. Uh, why was long life omitted? Well, Solomon had a problem with women. Uh, he had 600 wives and 300 concubines. A lot of them were foreign women who introduced him to foreign gods that he worshipped. That's the reason Solomon did not have long life. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ there. He says, you know, why do you worry about where your next meal is coming from? Uh, look, look at the birds. They, they, they don't go hungry. God provides for them. And look at the flowers that bloom. They're, they're, they're more glorious than Solomon in all his pomp and circumstance. And the lesson there is seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. I encourage you to do the same. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all the other things will be added to you. Verse 13, Then Solomon came from his journey to the high place that was at Gibeon, to Jerusalem, from before the tabernacle of the congregation, and reigned over Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, um, he went uh, before the ark and then burnt, uh, burnt offerings and peace offerings and had a, he threw a tremendous feast for all of his servants. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, which he placed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Now, the word chariots in this verse is different than the word chariot in verse 17. In verse 14, it can be uh, what we, I would call cavalry, uh, one horse and one man, not necessarily a vehicle with two wheels on it, which would be drawn by horses. Now, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, um, excuse me, let's back up here. In verses 14 through 17, we have a statement of Solomon's wealth. Uh, his, uh, God keeps his promises being the point. 
And the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plenteous as stones. The amount of silver was unbelievable. It was, there were many, as much silver as rocks in Jerusalem. And cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. Verse 16, And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, uh-oh, and linen yarn, the king's merchants, received the linen yarn at a price. Now this is a terrible uh, translation, and uh, I'll remind you, the King James 1611 Bible has a letter from the translators that worked on translating from the original languages into English. And they're basically apologizing uh, for the work that they did. Here is a good example of why the apology was necessary. Linen yarn makes absolutely no sense uh, in this verse. The Hebrew, and this is the reason everybody should have a strong concordance so you can check things like this out. The Hebrew, the word is mikveh, and it means in droves. Let's read the verse that way. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt in droves. The king's merchants received the droves at a price. Now, that makes sense, but linen yarn has nothing to do with horses coming out of Egypt. Well, why did I say, huh oh, when I said Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt? Deuteronomy chapter 17, God tells what the people, told the people of Moses what a king of Israel should do and what a king should not do. One of the things that a king of Israel should not do is multiply horses unto himself and especially not to go back to Egypt to get the horses. Why? Well, God brought Israel out of Egypt where they had been in bondage for 400 years. He's saying don't go back to Egypt for any reason. There in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, God says a king of Israel should not multiply wives to himself. Solomon had 600 wives and 300 concubines. Uh, he was kind of batting a thousand the wrong way as far as Deuteronomy 17 verses 16 and 17 were concerned. Verse 17, and they fetched up, this is uh, ascended or went up, and brought forth out of Egypt a chariot. Now this is more likely a two-wheel vehicle drawn by one or more horses for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for a hundred and fifty. And so brought they out horses for all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria by their means. Now these kings of the Hittites and kings of Syria had been defeated by the armies of Israel, and they were vassal kings. In other words, uh, they, they really had no power. Now, you know, we're going to notice in the Chronicles that there's some history that is not written of in the Chronicles that you find in 1 Kings. Uh, there was the matter of Adoniah, uh, Solomon's brother, the eldest surviving son of David. David had three older sons than Adoniah that had all been killed uh, prior to David's death. David outlived uh, a good number of his sons. But uh, Adoniah uh, rebelled against Solomon and was almost successful. Joab, the leader of the military, supported Adoniah. Abiathar, the high priest, supported, supported uh, Adoniah. All of David's other sons, with the exception of Solomon, supported Adoniah. But uh, Solomon was successful in retaining the throne. Uh, he told his brother Adoniah, I'm not going to have you killed if you'll behave yourself. And the next thing he did, though, he turned around and asked uh, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, 
to ask Solomon for Abishag's hand in marriage. The problem is Abishag was a concubine of David's, which meant he was laying claim to the throne. Another bit of history that is not recorded in the Chronicles, it's recorded in 1 Kings. Before David passed away, he said to Solomon, there's a couple of matters that I should have taken care of while I was still alive, but I didn't. And I want you in your wisdom to take care of them. The first was concerning uh, Joab, the commander in chief, David's nephew, the son of Uriah, uh, basically murdered Abner and Amasa. Uh, he shed their blood uh, when he was approaching them as a friend. Um, Abner, he was going to kiss him. He grabbed him by the beard as though as to kiss him and ran him through uh, and killed him. Uh, the second was Shimei, who cursed David as he was fleeing Absalom's rebellion and crossing Jordan, throwing rocks at David and dirt and cursed David. Uh, but then when David came back and was returning to Jerusalem, uh, Shimei was there. David said, no, and one of David's nephews said, let me go kill him uh, for offending you. And David said, no, this is a day of joy. I'm not going to have anybody killed in Israel. But David asked Solomon to take care of those two in his wisdom. Uh, Solomon, excuse me, Joab, after he saw that Adoniah was unsuccessful in his claim, went into the temple and grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar, uh, symbolic of power. Uh, Solomon heard where he was and he sent Benaniah, one of his faithful servants, and instructed him to slay Joab. Uh, Shimei, he also took care of, uh, he instructed Shimei to build a house, uh, in, I believe it was in Jerusalem, and never to go outside of Jerusalem. Uh, two of his servants ran away and he went to get them and Solomon found out and said, I told you not to go outside of Jerusalem and uh, he had him slain as well. Well, we, the main topic of these first few chapters, the building of Solomon's temple, the house of God. And we'll pick that up in our next lecture as we begin chapter two. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645, that number good throughout the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization. We try to teach God's Word in a positive format. Throwing out negative about others serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're listening by or studying via the internet somewhere around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in. Got a prayer request? You don't need a telephone number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. As, as David told his son Solomon, seek the Lord and you will find Him. And how do we seek Him? We seek Him in prayer, and we seek Him by studying the letter that He wrote to us. 
We do have these prayer requests. Father, we come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, drug addictions, Father, illness, you know, and if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these, Father. We also lift up our military troops around the world, Father. We ask that you watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's go with questions. First up today, we have Krista in Tennessee. Krista asks, where does the Bible say that judgment begins at the pulpit? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, which reads, judgment must begin at the house of God, and that's where you find the pulpit. Cameron in New York. Does God get sad too? I'm certain that God gets sad. Uh, we were created in His image and He has emotions and feelings just like we do, or I should say we have feelings and emotions just like He does. I'm very certain that what we allow to happen to unborn fetuses uh, and embryos through abortion causes our Heavenly Father to be very, very sad. Will in North Carolina, how big is hell going to get and is it going to have eternal space? Well, it won't have to be very big at all, Will. You see, once souls go into the lake of fire, which is hell, they're turned to ashes. So uh, ashes don't take up anywhere near as much space as uh, bodies do. So they're going to be totally consumed is what... Uh, that is saying, as it reads in Revelation uh, chapter 21, uh, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more sadness. Why? Because we're not going to even remember uh, what happened or who those people were that were destroyed in the lake of fire. No more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. What a wonderful place. Adrian in Arizona. I enjoy your Bible study each day and I have learned a lot from you. I'm glad you enjoyed the teaching. I want to ask you about the 501c3. Should you check out churches to see if they carry this and if they do stay away from that church as their teachings will not be recognized? Please let me know on this. I don't understand what this is. Could you explain? Well, a 501c3 is a designation that the federal government, the IRS in particular, uh, designates for nonprofit organizations, which religious uh, churches fall under the nonprofit, although the, uh, the 5013, there are different varieties of it depending on different nonprofit organizations. But Shepherd's Chapel Church is a 501c3. And, you know, that's a, a tremendous um, advantage uh, to churches. Why? Because it makes it to where people can donate to that organization and it's tax deductible. So uh, people who are able to donate uh, that is a good way for them to save on their taxes. They have a choice. They can either give it to Uncle Sam or they can give it to the nonprofit organization because it all comes out uh, basically the same uh, if they have to pay taxes on it. So I hope that helps, but there's nothing wrong with someone being a 5013C. Uh, what you want to listen to as far as the religious uh, nonprofits is what is their doctrine? What do they teach? Does it align with God's Word, or is it more the traditions of men? Linda in New York, what happens when you, when you retire, referring to Dennis Murray personally? Do you have someone to help you or take your place? Well, currently, I have no plans to retire. Uh, yes, we have associate pastors who study uh, the Word and have studied the Word for uh, many, many years. Uh, the way I look at it is I have faith in our Heavenly Father. Uh, when Moses died, uh, did he say, oh, well, Moses is dead. Uh, I guess my plan to take Israel into the Promised Land failed. No, he didn't. He raised up Joshua. 
And uh, when I'm called home, I'm sure Father will raise someone up. God promised that he would always send pastors, and I believe him. Marcel in Canada, is there life after we die? Yes, John chapter 3, verse 16, if you meet the condition. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've got to meet the condition, though. James in Alabama, how do you know that Christ was conceived on Christmas and born in September? Well, by understanding the courses of the priest. There were 24 courses of the priest that we covered in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. The eighth course is called Abiah, and that forms a link for us between 1 Chronicles 24 and Luke chapter 1, Verse 5, you see, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was serving as a priest in Jerusalem on the course of Abiah. Uh, that's when he prayed for a son. And Gabriel, the archangel, came and said, your prayer has been heard. You're going to have a son. Uh, and then we know from the course of Abiah what dates he would be serving in Jerusalem. He went home, which was a two-day journey after his course was finished, and then Elizabeth, his wife, conceived. Uh, we know from that when John the Baptist was conceived and therefore born nine months later, and we know that John the Baptist was six months elder than Jesus Christ. So we can determine that Jesus was conceived on uh, December 25th, born on September 29th. Arlene in Alaska, how should I dispose of a cross that I had in my home of, with Jesus hanging on it? It doesn't matter how you dispose of it. Uh, that cross uh, wasn't and isn't a deity to you. Uh, you can throw it away or you could give it to uh, a uh, organization that takes donations such as that that might uh, give it for goodwill to resell for if someone wants it in their home. Do doesn't matter. Susan from South Carolina, is it too young for a seven-year-old to be baptized? No, I've seen five-year-olds that are mature enough as Christians uh, to be baptized. And uh, if you've ever <clears throat> been to one of our, <coughs> excuse me, one of our Passover meetings, if someone who's very young gets in the pool, you'll see me uh, bend over and I ask the, the young person a couple of questions. Is Jesus your personal Savior? Have you accepted him as your Savior? And, you know, uh, children who have been raised up in a church that teaches God's Word mature a lot quicker than what people can give them credit for. So yes, I've seen five, six, seven-year-olds who are ready to be baptized. And uh, maturity as a Christian happens at different ages. Uh, I've baptized people who are in their 80s and they just became mature enough to be, as a Christian, to be baptized. Allen in Wisconsin, Revelation 20, verse 6, please explain why do good people keep losing? Boy, I don't know. I read Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, and I don't know. Then um, it states, blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection. Boy, that's not losers, that's winners. The, that means people are judged already into the eternity. And it goes on to say that the second death doesn't have any uh, power over them. That's the death of the soul. It means they're good to go into the eternity. Um, but it does say that is... Um, the rest of the, them are spirits are dead for the thousand years. That's what it says, and that's maybe what you're thinking. But the dead there are the spiritually dead. So if, if you think that the wicked uh, always get ahead and, and always win, you need to become familiar <clears throat> with Psalm 37, acrostic psalm. 
And in verses 7, 20, and 34 of Psalm 37, you find the acrostic. Those particular verses are set apart in the Hebrew language, the original language, because every other verse has four lines. 7, 20, and 34 have three lines, and if you read those, you understand that the wicked don't go ahead, uh, get ahead, they go into the lake of fire. Carol in Missouri, I just found a page on Facebook that says it's the official Shepherd's Chapel Facebook page. It links to your official Twitter page. Are these actually your pages? Because there are a lot of people starting to follow these. Well, Carol, I appreciate you calling that to my attention. Uh, one of my uh, tech savvy uh, folks showed me that Facebook page and that is definitely not our Facebook page. Uh, neither is the Twitter. Uh, not, don't believe everything you read on the internet. And I know you don't, Carol, but I'm saying this to other folks. Because, yeah, this Facebook says, official site of Shepherd's Chapel, which is a lie. They are not an official site of Shepherd's Chapel. Um, the best way for you to uh, go to our site is shepherdschapel.com, S-H-E-P-H-E-R-D-S-C-H-A-P-E-L.com. And then you can be assured you're on the official Shepherd's Chapel site. There are a lot of people that say they are this or that, uh, trying to gain your trust, and before you know it, they're, they'll be pulling the rug out from under you. Catherine in Texas, I have a question. Is there going to be more than one race uh, before Christ comes? Of course there will be before Christ comes. There are now, which is before Christ comes. Now, there will be uh, differences in uh, souls after Christ returns as well. You can read in Revelation chapter 21, uh, verse 24 that you have there, uh, the kings, and I'll add queens, of the nations. The nations in the Greek language is ethnos. That's the ethnic peoples uh, of the earth. Uh, A.J. in Florida. <clears throat> the people in the Old Testament, what happened to... Let me back up here. I'm A.J. from Florida. I'm 11 years old. <clears throat> and I love what you're doing. Well, I'm, I'm glad you do. On October 15th of this year, I will be one year saved. I have recently started watching your show, and I have a few questions for you to answer, okay? Number one, the people in the Old Testament, what happened to them? Did they go to heaven or hell without Jesus? Okay, that's a good question. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. After Jesus was crucified, he went to the prisoners. That's who those who had passed away before uh, grace came into, uh, which is where we live under the period of grace, the dispensation of grace, where we can receive forgiveness. They lived under the law and therefore they didn't have the same opportunity. But Jesus went to them and gave them that opportunity. Uh, then you follow, will the white throne judgment happen on earth, in heaven, or somewhere else? I think it'll be right here on earth. Number three, can you go over the end time starting with the tribulation and ending with us getting to heaven? Well, you're going to have a period where the Antichrist is here, that's called the Tribulation of Antichrist, the hour of tribulation, if you will. And after that, um, after the deadly wound occurs on the one world political beast system, Antichrist himself comes on the scene and heals the deadly wound. All the world is going to be deceived except those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 13 will document that. But then at the seventh trump, Jesus returns, uh, and those uh, that's when all flesh is dissolved, if you will. We all go into our spiritual bodies at that time. 
those who have worshipped the Antichrist will be spiritually dead throughout the thousand years, the millennium of Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Uh, those who did not worship the Antichrist are called overcomers. Uh, they participate in the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. After that, you have the great white throne judgment that you mentioned. Uh, then God's throne descends to earth uh, in Revelation chapter 21, and that's when the earth is rejuvenated. That's when the kingdom of God, uh, heaven if you will, heaven is wherever God is, is here on earth. <clears throat> Janice in South Carolina, what does it mean when a person said you have an old soul? I've never heard anyone say you have an old soul. Uh, I've never heard that. But all souls, in my opinion, were created at the same time. So there is no such thing as an old soul. We're all uh, the same age in souls. Uh, the age of souls really irrelevant. Time uh, has no effect. Souls don't age as human flesh ages. <clears throat> Renee in Georgia, do fallen angels have belly buttons or navels? Hope you and all the staff are all in good health. Love each one of you. Thanks for the real truth. Well, you're welcome. And uh, we all are doing very well, highly blessed. Thank you for asking. Fallen angels weren't born of woman, so I don't think that they have navels or belly buttons. Uh, Frank in Michigan, do we still live under the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, which is uh, a symbol in the Hebrew language, like a, it looks identical to an English comma, or tittle, which is an ornamental dot that looks like a period in English that changes uh, the sound of the Hebrew letter equivalent to the English letter E, but not one jot or tittle, Jesus said, not one comma or period of the law will be changed until uh, shall in no wise pass from the law. Jesus didn't come to change the law. He came to fulfill the law. Susan in Pennsylvania, will we as the elect be delivered up soon after the two witnesses arrive on earth? Or will it be after they are killed in the arena? And the arena in the King James Version Bible states street in the book of Revelation chapter 11, which is the Greek word pata, which means a wide place, just to clarify. Um, but before they are killed, Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, 8, uh, just prior, that, that's when the elect will be delivered up. Um, just before the two, the two witnesses are killed in Revelation 11, 7, 8, just prior, three and a half days to be exact, uh, before Jesus returns. So, that's when the you will be, the elect will be delivered up and some of you will be put in prison. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. There are things worth uh, going to jail for. Don't worship the Antichrist is the main thing. Paul in Ohio. My question, why don't you just say if we are in our earthly bodies that man proclaiming to be Jesus is an imposter, do not follow him. We do say that. We have said many times that if you can pinch yourself and you're still in the flesh and somebody's standing in front of you claiming to be Jesus Christ, they're a liar. They are an antichrist. When Jesus returns, we all instantly go into our spiritual bodies. The flesh bodies basically dissolve. Crystal in North Carolina, and thank you for your kind comments. I've heard you say there is only one unforgivable sin, but what about suicide? In some cases, if you die instantly, then you cannot ask for forgiveness for breaking a commandment, uh, and they shall not 
the commandment of thou shalt not kill. Please explain this to me. Well, murder is not the unforgivable sin. So if someone commits suicide, murders themselves, if you will, uh, and don't uh, ask for forgiveness, God can still forgive them in heaven uh, at that judgment. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, 1 John, the epistles of John, chapter 3, verse 15 says, uh, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That means while a murderer is still in the flesh, he cannot be forgiven, but God can forgive him in heaven. The unforgivable sin, on the other hand, uh, Luke chapter 12, verses 10 through 13, is for one of God's elect to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you when you're delivered up. To witness against the Antichrist. Linda in Arizona, I know when Linda did something that she's uh, now sorry for, I can promise you, Linda, what you did is not the unforgivable sin either. Uh, I might suggest that you order a work by Pastor Arnold Murray entitled Forgiveness. It's CD 30425. It has a lot to do with not only forgiving others, but forgiving yourself as well. And I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You seek the Lord by studying that letter that He wrote to you, and you find Him in His Word. You find Him in prayer when you talk to Him. So, And you know what? When you do that, it makes His day. And when you do that, blessings are going to start flowing in your life. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.